Well, hello and welcome to Church Online. I'm so glad that you're part of today's online experience. I'm really excited today as we continue our Summer Sunday series. Matt Powers is going to be bringing an incredible message to you this morning. But before he comes, check out what's going on and what's coming up. Check in on Facebook. This month, every check-in provides 50 gallons of clean drinking water to a community in need. Take a moment and fill out your virtual Connect card. We would love to know that you're with us today. We are so close to calling our new Alabaster campus home. Thank you to everyone who has invested in providing room at the table. For building updates, visit the link below. Summer small groups have been a blast and I hope you've connected and found your group. If you haven't, there's still some time. Check out all the groups online or on the church app. Our Columbiana Kids Fest begins tomorrow night. It's going to be a ton of fun. Be sure to invite all of the kids in your neighborhood. It begins at 6.30 nightly and you can pre-register online. Roots is your way to discover your gifts, your personality, and a place to serve at Cultivate. It's quick, it's easy, and available totally online. Visit the address below to get started today. We can't wait to serve with you. Baptism is one of the most exciting experiences as a Christian. We would love to celebrate baptism with you. If you would like to be baptized, please let us know in your Connect card. Well, that's all the news for today. If you need more information, please let us know on your Connect card. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to Cultivate Church Online. My name is Matt Powers. I'm one of the elders here at Cultivate Church, and i got to be honest, I am so excited to be hanging out with you guys today because it's not often that I get to hang out with all of you online as we are in our second week of our series, Summer Sundays. And this is actually the third year we've done this in July, and the coolest thing about this series is that it's not all tied to one general theme or one big idea. You can come in on a Sunday and you really never know quite what you're gonna get. It's just a completely different atmosphere. There's different types of platforms that are set up. Sometimes we have more of a Q&A or we have different people on the platform and it's more of a discussion. We bring in guest speakers and it's just such a cool experience. So I'd love to encourage you really throughout this month to come to one of our campuses in the Columbiana or Alabaster and just get to experience God speaking through and using other people because you really just never know what you're gonna get. And that's actually the same true for the message today. This is like an online exclusive only. It's only gonna be heard online it's not going to be at any one of our campuses at all. So it's just a really cool experience all month long. So I'm really excited to share this message with you guys today. I just feel like God just laid this down in my lap and said, hey, this is what people are going through. This is what I'd really like to speak into people. So my hope is it'll encourage us. It'll just allow us to maybe step out of a hole and really get moving forward in the purpose that God has for our lives. So I'm just really, really excited about it. Can't wait to, to get it started. And I've titled the message today, Wait on God. Because the truth is, the last 18 months, 2020 and 2021, for me, it has been the longest but quickest 18 months that I can ever remember. It feels like there are times where we're just spinning our wheels, just kind of going through the motions, just day after day after day, and just nothing was happening. But whenever I look back and I'm thinking something happened last year and it was actually two or three years ago, I'm like, where in the world did the last 18 months go? It's just been such a strange time. But I felt like for so often of it, we were just waiting. So I want to ask you a question today. How many of you feel like you were just waiting on something? Wherever you are, you can raise your hand because all of us at some point in time, we're just waiting. I feel like sometimes we're just waiting on God to do something, just saying, God, where are you in all of this right now? God, I'm just waiting for you to move. I'm just waiting for you to fulfill a promise in my life. God, I've been praying every single day. and I'm just waiting for you to answer a prayer. My marriage has been down in the dumps for months and months and months. God, where are you that day after day after day I show up to the same job every single day? I work harder than anybody and I just go under the radar unnoticed, unrecognized, unappreciated. And God, I know you have more for me, but where are you? Because I don't know how much longer I can continue to do this. God, the depression, 
the anxiety, the fear, the frustration, it is just overtaking my life. God, where are you in all this? I am just waiting on you. I know for most of us at some point in our lives, we feel that, and we may be feeling it right now. I know us at Cultivate Church, we understand the idea of waiting with our new campus in Alabaster that we are so close to the finish line on. We have just been waiting and waiting. It has been years in the making and something has come up and we think we have an opportunity and then it just seems to fall through the cracks. And even in the current facility that we're about to go into, if we had it our way and we went by our plans and what we thought, we would have actually been in this building last year. But things came up, delays happened. It wasn't happening on our time. We have to take a step back and realize that it's all on God's timing. It's all going to be the way that he wants it to work out. And it's going to be far better than anything that we could imagine. I mean, really, what's worse than waiting? For me, traffic, I hate waiting in traffic. I-65 in the summer on the weekends, come on. Everyone's going to the beach or coming home from the beach. I will drive 15 miles out of the way just to not sit in behind people in traffic and not go anywhere. Amazon Prime has ruined us. We used to order a package and it would show up in a week or so, but now Amazon Prime comes out with free two-day shipping, and then all of a sudden two days isn't good enough for us anymore either. So they come up with next day, and then next day isn't good enough. So they have opportunities where you can order something one day, and it'll show up the exact same day that afternoon. It's amazing because we hate to wait. When we were in the middle of the pandemic and we had to stay at home and we couldn't leave our houses and you couldn't go out to eat at our favorite restaurants, these companies like DoorDash and Grubhub became a phenomenon. They just exploded. You mean I can order food from my favorite restaurant and they're just going to drop it off of my house and I can eat it? That is amazing. Who cares if it's going to take 100 or 120 minutes to show up? I don't care. I'm able to eat my favorite restaurants at home. But if we open those apps now and try to order something now and we look and say, 35 minutes for fresh sushi? No way I'm waiting that long, but Captain D's can have shrimp here in 20 minutes, so I will settle for that. Why? Because we hate to wait. We hate to wait on God so much that it is, it is the Captain D's versus fresh food scenario, that we're going to settle for less than what we are promised just because we refuse to wait. So how difficult is it to wait on God? You'll see stories throughout the Bible where people are just waiting. In Genesis, the story of Abraham, God tells them that, hey, I'm going to give you a child through your wife, Sarah. And y'all, they were old. They were like super old. Like they should be working on retirement old and not having children old. But after a period of 25 years of that promise, God fulfills that promise and gives them a child. We see Moses in Numbers. He is leading his people out of Egypt to the land that God had promised them. And people are growing weary. They're starting to lose faith and they take a detour. And it takes them 40 years, 40 years to get to the land that God promised them. When David was to become king, you know, King David, David and Goliath, David, when he was going to become king and Samuel was at Jesse's house and said, hey, David, you're the man, you're going to be king. He didn't just take David with him and say, all right, tomorrow you're going to be king. But there was a period of waiting. David didn't even have the opportunity to kill Saul and take the throne. But David realized this was not the time that God had for him. Even Jesus didn't start his ministry until after 30 years. Throughout the Bible, we will see people who are just waiting on God to fulfill the promises. And for us, we are so impatient and we don't want to wait. We believe that while we're waiting, we're just sitting there and there is nothing that's happening. We feel forgotten. And the truth is, sometimes people will forget us, but the truth is that God doesn't forget who we are. Today, I want to talk through another story in the Bible. It's going to be the story of Joseph. And this is the story of Joseph, son of Jacob, not Mary and Joseph, uh, Jesus' earthly father, Joseph. But it's a great story, and it's a great story about waiting. So we're going to walk through that. We're going to talk about what it is to, to hear from God, what it means to wait on God, what we should do while we're waiting on God. So we're going to pray, and then we're going to get into the message this morning. So Father, we love you. God, I'm just so thankful for the opportunity to be able to gather together today. God, I pray for every single person who watches this or who, who listens to this, God, that we'll, we'll open our hearts to, to really take in your word. God, we'll open up our minds to receive it. God, my, my prayer is that we'll respond to it. 
that we'll take everything that you give us today and we'll take a step forward towards you to, to being closer to fulfilling the purpose that you have given every single one of us, God. And I pray that you'll get all the credit for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So the story of Joseph, we'll really see it throughout Genesis chapter 37 through 50. But it starts with Joseph hearing from God. He actually has a dream in which God has given him a vision. And I know you may be thinking, well, I don't even know if I should be waiting on God. Should I be or shouldn't I be? I don't even know if he's told me anything or not. But it really comes with about communication with God. And we can do that through several different ways. The first is really through prayer, is if we pray to God every single day, and we just have that open dialogue and that open conversation with him. And it's not just treated as a laundry list of things of God. I need my job to be better. I need to be healthy. I need my kids to be nice. I need my marriage to be good. We need, I need all this stuff, God. So now that you have it, you can take that. Let me know whenever you're done. And we just treat it as a wish list. But whenever we truly hear from God is in the time of silence. We have that conversation with him and we're talking to him, telling him how, how we're thankful we are for what we have and what we truly need. He will tell us. He will guide us in those ways. He'll also talk to us through his word. All last month, we talked about the Bible and the importance of the Bible and that God can actually read us whenever we are reading his word, that it is alive and he can talk to us. God will speak to us through other people and he will speak to us through dreams. And that's ex exactly what he does here with Joseph. So we're going to start the story in Genesis chapter 37, verses 5 through 11. And it says, one night Joseph had a dream. And when he told his brothers about it, they hated him even more than ever. Listen to this dream, he said. We were out in the field tying up bundles of grain. Suddenly, my bundle stood up, and your bundles all gathered around and bowed low before mine. His brothers responded, so you think you will be our king, do you? Do you actually think you will reign over us? And they hated him all the more because of his dreams and the way he talked about them. In verse 9, soon Joseph had another dream. And again, he told his brothers about it. Listen, I've had another dream, he said. The sun, the moon, 11 stars bowed low before me. But this time he told the dream to his father as well as to his brothers. But his father scolded him. What kind of dream is that, he asked. Will your mother and I and your brothers actually come and bow to the ground before you? And verse 11 says, but while his brothers were jealous of Joseph, his father wondered what the dreams meant. So here's Joseph. God has given him a vision. He's given him this dream that he is going to reign, that he's going to have influence, that he's going to have be important. And obviously he is so excited that he can't wait to tell everyone. He tells his brothers about it. He's telling his father about it. He's just excited about it, just like us any time that we're told anything. Anytime that we're promised something, anytime anything exciting happens to us, we can't wait to tell the world. We want to tell our parents. We want to tell our friends, our families about the job that we just got or the promotion that we just got. We can't wait to tell our friends about the girl we just met and how amazing she is. We want to tell the world. We go out to eat at the new restaurant and it is amazing. We can't wait to tell someone about it on social media and make a post about it. Why? Because we're so excited about it, because it's so amazing. We want to shout it to the world. And that's exactly what Joseph does here. It reminds me whenever you're a kid on Christmas. Come on, you know exactly what I'm talking about. You spend all that time making the Christmas list, taking out the catalog, circling all the toys that you want. So then on Christmas Eve, the night before Christmas, you are so excited that you can't sleep. You stay up all night long. You may get an hour or so of sleep and you wake up at three o'clock in the morning and you're waking your parents up because you cannot wait to see what Christmas brought. The same is true whenever we go on vacation. I know for me, I've got a vacation coming up in a few weeks and kind of already slipping into vacation mode. Why? Because I can't wait for that to happen. We hear that all the time. I can't wait. I can't wait for the weekend. I can't wait to go on vacation. I can't wait to go shopping. I can't wait to go out to eat tonight. I can't wait to get away for a little while. I can't wait for this. I can't wait for that. We can't wait for anything. We just refuse to wait. And Joseph is so excited about this. And if we were reading the MPPV version, the My Personal Preference version, it would have said, well, the very next day, Joseph became ruler of all the world. But that's not what it says. 
See, oftentimes we have the my personal preference version where we're told something. We feel like God is telling us something. We want it to happen our way right then, right there. I met my wife when I was 16 years old in high school. I know high school sweethearts. But at that time, I had no intention or no want to meet my wife. I had no idea I was going to meet my wife that young. It was my thought that, you know, hey, the hot girl in school just wants to go out with me. It's amazing. I'm so excited about it. But I didn't know what was to come. But a lot of times, we, the way we treat the my personal preference version would be, well, I met my wife, now it's time to get married. But God knew what he was doing whenever he pieced us together, that it didn't need to happen right away. His promise doesn't always happen immediately. We have to wait on his promise. That's exactly what Joseph does. So exactly what does that mean? What, does it, what happens when we wait? The first thing that we really have to understand is while we're waiting, it's a time of testing. The Bible tells us that it's a time of testing. If it always happened the way that we wanted it to happen, if God just gave us something and he immediately met our expectations, he would never have the opportunity to actually exceed our expectations. And the Bible tells us that his ways are higher than our ways and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts, that he far and well exceeds our expectations almost all the time. But what we learn from the story of Joseph and a lot of times in our own lives is that whenever we have these plans and we have this word, we're so excited about it, often it's met with challenges and it's met with obstacles. You know, Jesus tells us the enemy comes to steal, kill, and destroy. And we kind of see that play out through the rest of Joseph's story. The remainder of chapter 37, we see Joseph's brothers are kind of that first obstacle. They're out working in the field, and, the, and their father, Jacob, tells Joseph to go out into the field. And his brothers immediately, they're making fun of him. They're mocking him. The Bible says, like, oh, here comes the dreamer. Here comes Joseph, almighty Joseph. So they come up with this terrible idea. They say, we hate him so much that we're going to kill him. They decide they want to kill Joseph, but luckily one of the brothers speaks up and comes up with a plan that's just as bad and says, no, we're not going to kill him. But instead, we're going to sell him into slavery, and that's exactly what they did. So you can imagine Joseph at this time. He has this vision from God that he is going to be a ruler. He's going to be important, and all of a sudden, his brothers are taking him, and they're selling him into slavery. This is the very first obstacle that we see. And actually they talk about it in Psalm chapter 105, uh, verse 19 says, until the time came to fulfill his dream, the Lord tested Joseph's character. So here's Joseph, he's sold into slavery and it would have been so easy for him to just be like, God, whoa, what in the world is happening here? But what happens is he, he is purchased by Potiphar. Now Potiphar was an Egyptian officer and he was a very powerful person. So whenever Joseph got there, he worked for Potiphar. And we pick up his story in chapter 39, verses 2 and 3 of Genesis. It says, the Lord was with Joseph. So he succeeded in everything he did as he served in the home of his Egyptian master. Potiphar noticed this and realized that the Lord was with Joseph, giving him success in everything he did. So Potiphar immediately recognized that, you know what, this guy is faithful. God is with this guy every step of the way. Joseph, this first obstacle, he remains faithful. This was a time that he was being tested. And he continued to remain faithful to his master. He remained faithful to the Lord. Listen, Potiphar thought Joseph was the man, that he could do no wrong, that he was amazing. Potiphar loved Joseph. The problem is, so did Potiphar's wife. See, Potiphar's wife really, really liked Joseph, like way, way too much. And one day, Potiphar's wife tries to seduce Joseph. And whenever Joseph's saying, no, 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 I'm going to respect my master. I'm going to respect the Lord. I'm not going to do that. She grabbed his robe and he ran away and she began to scream and she completely turned the tables and told Potiphar, hey, your servant, Joseph, he tried to seduce me. And this infuriated Potiphar. So what does he do? Potiphar throws Joseph in prison. It's another huge obstacle for Joseph. This is another huge test for him. It would have been so easy for him to just quit, for him to just say, God, this was not part of the dream. This was not part of the plan that you promised me at all. I don't understand what you're doing right here. I don't get it. So I quit. This is not what you promised me at all. He could have got mad. He could have quit. He could have lost faith. He could have, uh, could have gone out to seek vengeance against Potiphar, Potiphar's wife, or even his brothers for that matter. But what we learn about Joseph, that time again and time again and time again, he remains 
faithful. So many times when we're tested, it is so easy for us just to cross our arms, to bow up, to get upset and say, this isn't worth it. God, what were you doing here? You didn't tell me about this. You didn't tell me about this problem. But Jesus does tell us that in this world you will have trouble. But don't be afraid because he has overcome the world. But we don't always take that to heart because we're upset. This isn't how we expected it to happen. God will often do something in us before he does anything for us. And that's exactly what we're seeing happen with Joseph. Joseph, was, he was in trouble. This is a very difficult, very, very hard time for Joseph. And I love what James says in James chapter 1, verse 2, and 2 through 4. He says, Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. James, what in the world are you talking about? Troubles and great joy. I don't know what he's thinking here, but I know for us and I know for me, troubles and great joy just don't go together. But look what he says in verse three. He says, for you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. It's exactly what we see Joseph going through right here. This is a time of testing. It's trouble, but it's an opportunity for Joseph to grow. His endurance is being built. Oftentimes, when we're going through something, well, maybe something at the job isn't working out quite how we expected, or maybe our finances are in a little bit of trouble. Or maybe things just aren't the way that we thought that they should be. This is typically a time for testing, a time for us to build our endurance, a time for us to persevere so we will be ready for the next test because this is always a time of testing. What we have to realize about the time of testing is what we do during that time, which is really the next point that we really need to understand is that we need to work our weight. We have to work while you're waiting. There's so many times that we don't like to work while we're waiting. Think about sitting in a doctor's office. You go in, you sign in, you just sit in a chair, you just wait for what feels like hours and nothing ever happens. We typically do that whenever we're with God. We just sit there like, and we're just frustrated. And someone asks, what's going on with you? Huh, just waiting on God. I'm just waiting for him to show up. Maybe he'll finally open a door for me. So I'm just going to sit here and I'm just going to wait on him. But I will love what Re Revelation says about opening doors. It says, look, I stand at the door and knock. If you hear my voice and open the door, I will come in and we will share a meal together as friends. You see, God doesn't often just go through opening up doors like, hey, man, here's a door. Walk through this one. Hey, how about this door right here? But what he's saying is saying, hey, if you hear me knock and you hear my voice and you open the door, I will come in. We have to work our weight. We don't have to just sit there and wait. We need to work our weight. And we see that's exactly what Joseph does. We pick up his story in Genesis chapter 39. This is verse 21 through 22. And this is after Potiphar has thrown him in prison. And it says, but the Lord was with Joseph in the prison and showed him his faithful love. And the Lord made Joseph a favorite with the prison warden. Verse 22, before long, the warden put Joseph in charge of all the other prisoners and over everything that happened in the prison. So while Joseph, again, he's persevering during that time of testing, he's been sold into slavery. He's been thrown into prison. And again, he continues to remain faithful to the Lord to the point where now he's kind of getting a little bit close to what God's promised. Now, not, he's not over an all land and all people, but he's over everyone in this prison. The warden loves him. What happens, and we see what happens in, in, in chapter 40, is two of Pharaoh's main guys, his chief cupbearer and his chief baker, they're thrown into prison. They made Pharaoh mad about something, and he just tosses them into prison. The Bible doesn't really go into it, but he may have changed the Wi-Fi password or something. Who knows what happened, but he got angry, and he threw them in there. And one night, these two gentlemen had dreams that scared them to death, and they were assigned to Joseph during this time. So the next day, they woke up, and Joseph saw him. was like, guys, what's going on? Why are you so worried? And they began to tell him, well, look, we had these dreams, and we don't quite know what they mean. So Joseph said, well, tell me your dreams. Let's let God interpret these dreams. So the cupbearer went first, and he begins to tell Joseph his dream. And Joseph said, okay, well, well here's what your dream means. See, Pharaoh's going to have this huge party in three days. And in that three days' time, you're going to be restored as the chief 
cupbearer. And this just made the guy so happy and so excited. He's like, Joseph, you are the man. Listen, I'm never going to forget about this. As soon as I get out of here, I'm going to tell Pharaoh all about you, and we're going to get you out of here and do something better for you. You know how this had to excite Joseph. Like, all right, finally, something's going to happen. I'm going to get out of here. And the chief baker, hearing this, decides, okay, well, I want to tell you my dream now, because he was excited for the news that the cupbearer got. So the baker begins to tell Joseph the dream, and Joseph said, well, in three days' time, Pharaoh's going to kill you. And that's exactly what happens. In three days, the cupbearer was restored to his position, and Pharaoh killed his chief baker. Joseph was working while he was waiting in prison. Listen, just because God is silent doesn't mean that he's not there, because what happened when the chief cupbearer got out? He said, hey, I'm going to tell Pharaoh all about this. We're going to get you out of here. Well, that didn't happen. In fact, two years passed where Joseph just remained in prison. And Joseph's got to be thinking, God, where are you in all of this? What's going on with everything right here? You know, just because we don't see him doesn't mean that there's not a lot at play. You know, I like to compare it to the wind. You know, we can't see the wind blow at all. But oftentimes we can hear the wind, we can definitely feel the wind, but the biggest thing is we can see the effects of the wind. Much of the time, like God, we can't always see him. Sometimes we can feel him, sometimes we can hear him, but we can usually see the effects of him moving in our lives. So what do we do? How do we work our way? It takes discipline. It takes discipline every single day day that no matter the circumstances, the situation that we may be walking through, that we are going to continue work and we are continue to be faithful and obedient to what God wants us to do. We have to pray every single day, have that conversation, open up our Bibles. We have to serve. We have to worship Him. We have to be faithful to Him. You now, my wife has a saying that she says, what we do in the dark always comes out in the light and it's usually meant in negative context like hey you don't do that behind anyone's back because eventually the truth is going to come out but the same is very true here you see god is always watching what we're doing in the dark when nobody is watching what we're doing behind closed doors are we still faithful to god are we still opening his word are we still worshiping him are we still praying to him when no one else sees what's going on you know, when you plant a tree and it begins to grow and grow and grow and it gets bigger and bigger in the spring and in the summertime, they're beautiful. They're big, they have flowers, they have leaves, they have blossomed, and they look so great. They look very plentiful, they look very, very good. But whenever you get to the winter time and it gets cold and all the flowers and all the leaves and everything falls off, it just looks dead. It looks barren. But what we don't see is everything underneath the ground. You see, the tree is that life underground. The roots are deep in the ground, and that is where its life is. That is where it is growing. That is where all the work is done, something that nobody can see. The same goes true for our lives. Whenever we are doing the work that no one else can see, that no one's posting about on social media, that no one's seeing whenever we're out, that no one's saying, hey, that's so great, that's so amazing, that's so fantastic. That's where we truly grow. That is where we truly grow and develop our relationship with God. It takes full trust. It takes full surrender to Him. We are being prepared while we're working our way. Why in the world are we being prepared while we work? The reason is because his promise is worth the wait. And we'll see this come to fruition in Genesis chapter 41 with Joseph. Two years had passed since he told the chief cupbearer what was going to happen. And a couple nights, Pharaoh begins having these, these dreams. And they begin to worry Pharaoh just a little bit. And he, he's stressed out about them. And he tells his cupbearer about them. And he's saying, I've had these dreams. And the cupbearer immediately says, hey, remember that time you threw me in prison? Well, there was this guy there, and his name was Joseph. And he told me what, what my dreams meant, and they came true. Maybe we should get him here, and he will tell us what these dreams mean. So Pharaoh's like, absolutely, let's get Joseph up here. Maybe he can tell me what's going to happen. So they bring Joseph to Pharaoh. And Pharaoh begins to tell him the two dreams. And Joseph says, okay, well, the first dream means that we're going to have, you're going to have seven 
years of prosperity. It's going to be great. You're going to have abundance. It's going to be a very successful, prosperous seven years. But the second dream means that's going to be followed by seven years of famine. And it's going to be bad. It's going to impact everybody. It's going to hurt a lot of people. So my recommendation would be during that seven years of prosperity, we need to stock up. You need to be prepared for whenever the famine hits. And we'll finish the story in Genesis chapter 41, verses 37 through 40. It says, Joseph's suggestions were well received by Pharaoh and his officials. So Pharaoh asked his officials, can we find anyone else like this man so obviously filled with the Spirit of God? Then Pharaoh said to Joseph, since God has revealed the meaning of the dreams to you, clearly no one else is as intelligent or wise as you are. Verse 40 says, you will be in charge of my courts and all of my people and will take and all of my people will take orders from you only i sitting on my throne will have a higher rank than yours here it is joseph's dream what god promised him finally happening this will happen whenever joseph was 30 years old he had the dreams when he was 17 he went through 13 years of testing. He went through 13 years of waiting and had obstacle after obstacle. His brothers wanted to kill him. He was sold into slavery. He was thrown in prison. He was promised a way out, and that didn't happen. 13 years of disappointment after disappointment after disappointment, but God fulfilled his promise. He fulfilled his promise to Joseph. I mentioned earlier that I met my wife when I was 16 years old. Whenever we graduated high school and went off to college in 2002, my wife, she was ready to get married. We were high school sweethearts. We had spent the last three years together. She was like, you are the one. It is time to get married. But for me, it's like, well, we're just really getting into college. I'm just kind of figuring out what my major is going to be, what I'm going to do with the rest of my life. I didn't feel like it was necessarily time to get married. And I know this disappointed her, made her probably question things, maybe began to lose hope in the relationship, thinking, God, I, I don't really know if maybe he isn't the one. And then three years later in 2005, we were graduating from college and it was my turn. The roles were completely reversed. I was ready to get married. I knew what I was going to do with my life. I was ready to go out and find the job. I had gotten my degree. Everything was going to be great. We had spent the last seven years together and it was going to be amazing. She was the woman that I wanted to spend the rest of my life with. But at this time, she wasn't ready to get married. And this was devastating. It was heartbreaking. I was like, Why? how? How could things have changed in the last three years? You wanted to get married just a few years ago. What in the world happened? But looking back, and what I've learned is this was truly a time of testing for us. And during the three years from 2005 until we eventually did get married in 2008, it was a time for me to work. It could have been so easy for me just to give up and just to quit. Just to say, you know what? Just wasn't in the cards. This just isn't, isn't, this just isn't what I thought it was gonna be. It just isn't what I thought it should be. So I'm just gonna pack it in, give up, and move on. But looking back to that and that whole time that we spent together, whenever we first met to the time we got married, I quickly realized that, you know what? If we had gotten married whenever she wanted to in 2002, it wouldn't have worked out. If we had gotten married in 2005 when I was ready and she wasn't, it wouldn't have worked out. What I learned is that we had to go through all of those things together to be able to get to the point where we were in 2008 to the point to where we are now. And she is the love of my life, my best friend. She makes me better at everything that I do. And if we hadn't gone through that, there's no way that we would be where we are today. If we wouldn't have waited, if we would have just gave up, but we would have just quit and said, you know what, this is too hard. This isn't what I thought it was going to be. We wouldn't be where we are now. Something that I've really, really learned is that when it comes to the timing of God, when it's not time, you can't force it. And when it is time, you can't stop it. You know, God spoke to his people in Israel for the last time in the book of Malachi. And then they went through 400 years of silence where nothing was happening. Nobody 
was hearing from God. No one was seeing God move whatsoever. You know, people had to be thinking, what in the world is going on? They waited 400 years until the next time God showed up was the birth of Jesus. It was the birth of the Savior in the world. And all that time, all 400 years, it happened at the exact perfect moment, at the exact perfect time, because his time is perfect. His promises are worth the wait. His promise was worth the 400 years. His promise to Joseph was worth the 13 years. His promise to Abraham was worth the 25 years. It was worth the 40 years to the people that Moses was leading. The time was worth the wait. His promise is worth the wait. What we need to understand and what we need to know is, is that God wants to do things for us. God has promises for every single one of our lives and he wants us to be a part of that. He wants us to live amazing lives for him. But we have to understand that we will be tested, that we will have to work during that time. We'll have to be able to endure, but we have to know that God always follows through to promises to his children. And there's no greater promise than John 3.16, probably the most famous scripture that, that anyone knows. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son. So those who believe in him will not perish, but have eternal life. You know, the truth is a lot of the time we can say we're waiting on God, but usually God's waiting on us. He's waiting on us to take a step towards him. And if you're here today and you're watching this or listening to this, and you haven't yet taken even that first step towards God, today is the day. He's just waiting on us to take a step towards him to, to show us everything that he can do. And if that's you, I wanna say a prayer with you right now. You can just follow me in this prayer to begin that relationship with Jesus, to begin that relationship, to see all the promises that God has in our lives. So Father, we love you. God, today I recognize that, that I'm a sinner. God, that I don't have it all together. And God, today I pray that you'll forgive me for all of my sins. That I recognize that you sent Jesus here as my Lord and my Savior to wipe the slate clean for me. And today I recognize that, God. I want to make him number one in my life and live a life on purpose for you. And God, for every single one of us, I pray that whatever's going on in all of our lives, Father, that we'll, we'll take a step out of it. That we will understand that your promises are worth the waiting. Your promises are worth the testing, God. That we'll reach for you. We'll talk to you. They will continue to be faithful to you, even whenever we feel like nothing is going on, even when we feel like that you're not there, that we will know that you're always working, even whenever we don't see it, that we'll be, continue to be faithful in that, God. And I pray that we'll just step towards you so we can continue on the purpose that you have given every single one of us, God. And I pray that you'll get all the credit for it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. What an incredible message. Thank you, Matt Powers, for sharing that incredible word with us. I want to say, if you made a decision to say yes to Jesus, please let us know. You can click the link there at Church Online, or you can send us an email and let us know about the decision you made. We would love to pray for you, and we would even love to send you some information on how to take your next steps in your relationship with Jesus. Hey, before we go, we're going to take a quick second. We're going to transition to a moment of giving. We do this every week in response to what Jesus has called us to do. And I want to tell you that every week that we walk in obedience, it opens the door to blessing on your life. The Bible says that those that can be trusted with little, they will be trusted with much. So when God gives us a blessing, He watches how we steward it. You and I are called to carry that, steward it well, and honor God with it so that He gets the most out of it. So church, thank you for doing that and for being that hands and feet of Jesus because we're touching communities around us and we're touching the world that is connected to us. So thank you for living life on purpose. Well, it's been a great day together. I pray that you have an incredible week living life on purpose. We'll see you next week online or in person.